As you probably noticed, I am not Sean. <laughs> Sean's right there. And I'm over here and I get to do this today, which is like such a such a, a, a pleasure, such an honor to be able to get up here and share what I feel the Lord is, is doing in our hearts. And uh, this is uh, a two week thing, so you're stuck with me again next week. Uh, that's how it works. So this is gonna everything is the setup for the this is the this is the what we have and then next week's the how to use it kind of a kind of a thing. So um, gonna get a get a double dose here. We're gonna go to Romans twelve and we're gonna look at the first two verses this week and then we're gonna look at the next two verses next week. All right? So that's the idea here. Uh, Romans twelve verses one and two say this. It's a familiar passage of scripture. It says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay. Paul says, present your body as a sacrifice which is spiritual. And in doing so, God accepts you and declares your holiness. Now that's a sandwich right there. I mean, that's a boom. You know, he says all of this stuff in this one sentence. All right? You're going to present your body, which is who you are. You're everything. You know, your, your personhood. You're going to present your personhood to God. And guess what? It's acceptable. It's holy. You know, so let's recognize right away that going into the presence of God, going before the presence of God, is something that we are designed for, is something that we are instructed to do, and is something that is okay. You know, well, God is up here and I'm down here. Can we, can we work through that thinking and say that's, that's by our choice, not his design? All right. Now, why? There's this phrase at the beginning of that that says, I, I'm urging you to do this based on his mercy. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's what we're going to hang out with. That concept of mercy is what we're going to digest today. All right. Uh, Second Corinthians 1 3 gives us the origin of mercy. If you're a note taker, I'm going to give you like really cool key points. So if you're not. <laughs> You'll remember everything that I said. So, uh, the origin of mercy is God. Look at Second Corinthians one three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Mercy is a God entity. Mercy comes from God. He's the origin of it. All right. So let's define what it is. We know a source. Let's define what it is. Definition of mercy. Easy notes today. Key points here. Definition of mercy. All right. And this may be a little different than if you look it up in the dictionary. All right. But I'm going to give you a spin on, on mercy. All right. The definition of mercy. God's covenant loving kindness. It's a love that's based on himself and his choice. That's the word covenant in there. God can't do anything that's against his character. Does that make sense? God is limited by himself. So can I say that? Mm -hmm. You know? It's not that God can do anything. God is limited by his own character. God is limited by the covenant that he has put in place. Therefore, he is love. He is a loving God. So mercy defined. God is the source. He's the origin of it. But the definition is the loving kindness that comes out of him based on his covenant that he's established. It is a noun that requires a verb to happen. All right? Now let's talk about the availability of mercy. These points are just easy outlined today, right? The availability of mercy. This is Lamentations chapter 3, starting at verse 22. 
The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. He's the origin of this thing called mercy, which we can only wrap our heads around when we understand the spiritual dimension of the covenant relationship that we are in. And yet every single day there's an opportunity to understand it in a greater way. Mm -hmm. That's the availability of mercy. Now, that verse continues and gives you the application of mercy. It says this, I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So, there you go, this is the one right here. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. That's what mercy does. Right? It is good to wait quietly and receive salvation from the Lord. He's already talking to saved people here. You know, we're not talking about um, <coughs> salvation as it applies to a redemptive process where there's a sin issue that's there. This is talking about mercies being applied and salvation being applied. Well, when you interact with mercy, you're accepted. When you interact with mercy, your physical becomes spiritual. When you interact with mercy, the thoughts that you think transform. When you interact with mercy, God is 100% behind you. He declares you're holy. He declares your acceptance. He responds to this thing. But it's based on him. All right? So, uh, Genesis chapter 3, you know the story. Uh, Adam and Eve have sinned. They have disobeyed God. And God is, is sending them out of the Garden of Eden. All right? That's the short version of everything. Picking up at verse 23. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. And he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. And after sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden. And he placed a, a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, I would love to rabbit trail and talk about the sword. But I'm actually going to not go that direction. It's just, just real, real quick. Sword. It's all, it's, a flaming sword is, is indicative of the personhood of Jesus Christ. All right? And this is all symbolic. These are all real events that took place in the physical that have a spiritual truth for us to experience today. All right? So literally, Adam and Eve stood there and saw two angels and a flaming sword. In their physical self, they saw this stuff. This is physical, literal things that are taking place on earth. But they have spiritual application and symbolic meaning to us. So when I say that it's symbolic, please don't think I'm, I'm discrediting the fact that literally this stuff happened. Right. Right? Okay. The sword is symbolic of the personhood of Jesus Christ. Because, all right, let's think about this. First off, he's the light, right? He's the light of the world. All right. Now, Jesus is the word made flesh, correct? No, the word of God is what? 
the sword of the spirit, sharper than any two-edged sword. Jesus comes back in Revelation. What's coming out of his mouth? Yeah. Sword. Okay. So, <laughs> book in the Bible, short version. This is representing Jesus, but it's also representing um, Holy Spirit. Because all through Scripture, we see Holy Spirit represented as fire through the pages of Scripture. Now, fire also represents God the Father. Because Hebrews explains God is a consuming fire. There are only three things in Scripture that the Scripture actually says God is. God is light, God is love, God is a consuming fire. Everything else are descriptions about him, characteristics of him. But there are three places in Scripture that God is something. All right, one of which is fire. Now, in Leviticus, you remember, uh, as they traveled through the wilderness, they, there was a, a cloud by day, the fire by night. The pillar of fire led them. The pillar of fire fought for them. It was representative of the presence of God. The pillar of God placed himself between Israel and Egypt as they crossed the Red Sea and so forth. Now, in Leviticus, the very first time the altar in the tabernacle of the wilderness was lit so that they could perform sacrifices. It was actually lit from the pillar of fire. Okay? This is why there's a story of people offering strange fire to God. They're trying to sacrifice on fire that wasn't his. Wow. And they couldn't do it. Sacrifice was not acceptable to God. Okay? So, you've got a lot of imagery here. But what you have it's, it's wild. You have a God who is he's a covenant God. He's a relationship God. His loving kindness towards his covenant is manifest in his mercy, which is afresh every day. And he, now he's got two people that are supposed to interact with that. All right? So what does he do? He's, he has to, he can't compromise on his own standard. So he has to account for, the, for what has happened. And Though they are designed for paradise and fellowship with God, he has to drive them out from that because he cannot compromise on himself. Okay? And yet, in the midst of that, because of his passion and his great love, what does he do? He sets up this interesting scenario on the eastern side of the garden. All right? Now, when Jesus returns, where is he coming from? coming from the east. Right. See, there's so much here. All right? And he sets this up, and he puts two angels there to guard the way to the tree of life. So he's got these two angels that are there, and their job is to cover up his presence. Now why would God cover up his presence? It's so that people can get close to it. Does that make sense? All right, so picture this. When you read this, you could, you could interpret this to say that the angels are there to stop them from getting, you know, from going to the garden. What if the angels are there to cover his presence so they can get as close as they can? It's mm -hmm. good. Okay? Now, why would that make sense? Put that in the context of Scripture. Let's go to Exodus 25. You interpret scripture with scripture. Alright? So, this is the symbolism of mercy. Exodus 25, starting at verse 17. God is giving instructions to the nation of Israel as to how he's going to be worshipped. Okay? He tells them to do this. He says, make the ark's cover. This is in reference to the ark of the covenant. Unfortunately, this generation has not seen Indiana Jones. So, hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey. No. So, Ark of the Covenant, all right, it's, a, it's a box made out of wood. It's covered in gold. And it was placed in the most holy place in the, in the tabernacle and eventually in the temple. And it, you know, it held the Ten Commandments. It had manna. It had Aaron's rod. It budded. All these things were in there. But... What it was, it was a resting place for God's presence. Okay? So, make the ark's cover. So the lid that goes on this thing. Make the ark's cover. The place of atonement from pure gold. 
They must be 45 inches long, 27 inches wide. And then make two cherubim from hammered gold and place them on the two ends of the atonement cover. Mold the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover, making it all of one piece of gold. The cherubim will face each other and will look down on the atonement cover with their wings spread above it. They will protect it. Interesting imagery. We we're seeing a repeat of the imagery from Genesis chapter 3. Okay? Now, what is the role of this piece of equipment for the nation of Israel? All right, it is the lid that sits on the Ark of the Covenant. It is the place where the presence of God rests. The cloud would rest on this seat. We call it the mercy seat. All right? Now, it was so significant that uh, one time a year there was what was called the Day of Atonement in the nation of Israel. And what they would do, they would have, they would sacrifice two lambs. Um, one was, well, they, they sacrificed one and they didn't sacrifice the other. One, the priest laid hands on it, was sent out in the wilderness to symbolize that, they, that their sins were being carried off. All right? And that's where we get the term scapegoat from. All right? Um, it was, all, all your sin was placed on this animal and you literally stood and watched it disappear. You watched it walk away. The second was was taken to the altar, the brazen altar. It was sacrificed, and its blood was kept in a bowl. And then the priest would take the blood, and he would go into the first little uh, room. He's not quite at the Ark of the Covenant yet. He's go, he goes in the first room, and there's an altar that's got incense on it. So he takes the blood of the lamb, and he takes the incense, and he goes into the most holy place, which is where the Ark of the Covenant is, with the mercy seat lid, with the presence of God sitting on it. And he takes the incense, and he waits until the smoke from the incense has filled the space. All right? And as the smoke from the incense begins to fill the space, he then takes the blood of that lamb, and, and sprinkles the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat. And in doing so, it symbolizes that, because uh, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. It symbolizes that God has accepted the blood sacrifice. All right? And by accepting the blood sacrifice, they are now forgiven of their sins. All right? Um, it's interesting, I want to hang on here just for a second. The role that incense plays in going before mercy. All right? Incense is a symbol in Scripture. Again, it's a literal thing. It's actually there. You can experience it in the physical, but it's a symbolic spiritual principle for us. The incense is a symbol of worship and intercession. All right? That actually comes out of a concept that's taught in, in uh, the book of Revelation. This is before the throne of God, there is there's uh, a bowl of incense, all right? And, they, and there's a reference, they call it harp and bowl, and then there's worship and there's incense, and they combine the concept of uh, song and intercession, all right? Um, and so it's... It's such an important part of experiencing mercy, accessing mercy, by waiting for the incense to fill the room. All right? You really unlock the mercies of God. You present yourself. It's not like it's, it's an, it, there's an intention to it, to do it. It's not difficult to do. It's not like, it's not like God made it a challenge to do, to go before his presence. But it's not something that's passive either. You've got to decide, you know, you, you purpose in your heart. You be aware of what of the choices of choosing of this day that I'm going to go before God. His mercies are fresh, and I'm going to access them. That's good. You know? That's good. All right. Now, there's another place in Scripture where we see this same symbolism. Okay? And it's... You know, the, 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 uh, the cherubim covering the mercy seat is all through the pages of Scripture, all, all the way up into the time of Jesus. All right. Um, but 
But I want you to go to John chapter 20 with me. Okay? Now, John is a unique gospel because John chapter John presents Jesus as God all the way through. Um, it's the only gospel that does not have the birth of Jesus recorded in it. It says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten. Okay, so it's it's right out of the gate presenting Jesus is just He's God. There's no getting around the fact that the heavenly presence of God is now in this physical man who is now walking around in our midst. All right? Just like in the Old Testament, there was no denying that the cloud was God. All right? When the cloud moved, they moved. The cloud rested on the mercy seat. All right? And so John comes right out of the gate and he says, look, everything that you know about the presence of God is on this guy. All right? And you're going to behold it. All right. Jesus does his ministry, death, burial, resurrection. Let's look at the resurrection of Jesus. John chapter 20, starting at verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus is. Had been lying. All right. You've got Genesis chapter 3, where you have two angels covering the presence of God, providing access for Adam and Eve to come to a place of worship and get as close to his presence as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. You've got Exodus 25, talking about the cherub covering the presence of God providing access for, for the priest to be able to atone for sin underneath the intercession and the worship that is taking place. You've got John chapter 20 where Jesus has now risen from the dead and there are two angels who are standing there and they're not covering anything. Right. Amen. And look at Mary. You read it in some of the other gospels and you go, why, what are you looking for? Why you look for the living among the dead? We're out of a job. <laughs> we're not covering up his presence anymore. In fact, we're going, we're telling you, go tell everybody what you saw. Go tell the others. Because it's not about covering up God's presence so man can get as close as he can. It's about the fact that it is finished. Right. And that, right. and that, you have these two angels right here in John chapter 20. You know, were they the same angels that were back in Genesis 3? And inst instead of guarding the way, now they're saying, there's a new way. There's the way. He's truth. He's life. Go tell everybody about it. And then, uh, verse 13, Dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked her, because they had taken away my Lord. And she replied, I don't know where they have put him. I don't know where the presence of God is. I'm supposed to come to you guys. You guys are supposed to have it covered up. We've been doing this gig for thousands of years. I don't understand. All right. <laughs> she turned to leave and saw someone standing there. And it was Jesus. I mean, it's that simple. And he says, why are you crying? And who are you looking for? And at first she thinks he's a gardener. He said, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've put him. And then Jesus calls by name, Mary. And immediately she knows exactly who he is. And she just, I mean, she just embraces his presence. She just embraces the guy. You know, she's just loving on him. He's telling her what he's going to do. You know. Amen. So let's go back to that very first verse. I'm summing all up. Romans chapter 2. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now, does that peace now have a bigger picture to you? When God said, when, when Paul says all of this works because of God's mercy, all right, the history behind that is it is it's all based around his presence. It's all based around there was a time when it, there was a separation there. 
And so the mercy seat was actually, it actually covered his presence. And now we're in a different time. Now when he says, by the mercies of God, wow, there's not a stopping point to that. All right? He says, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. There's not, there's, there's no more sacrifice necessary. There's no more scapegoat necessary. There's no more process necessary. The process is completed. You have access to him because of his mercy, you're acceptable. So you go to him in your physical, which is your spiritual service of worship. All right. That's the history behind why Paul can make that huge statement. And like, Paul was that guy. So all of the Old Testament stuff, he was so well versed in it. Like, that's what it would have meant to him when he says, present yourself to God based on mercy. Okay? So I'm going to stop there, and we're going to move into the second half of this um, next week. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to shut this thing off here. Hang on. Bear with me.